This message has been brought to you freely by Ecclesia Kingdom Movement. To support our ministry and partner with us to increase our impact across the world, reach more people and take advantage of more platforms, we encourage you to consider making a monthly gift of any amount or one-time gift towards the work of the gospel. We'd like to thank you in advance for your support and we value your partnership. I believe that there is something irreparably that is going to shift in this place tonight. And I'm also confident with all my heart that we have the right man for the job. So I want you to stand with me tonight. I want you to prepare your heart with expectation and reverence to God. Let's just take 30 seconds. Just say, Father, deal with me tonight. Go on. I want you to stretch your hands towards God's servant and say, Lord, put in him what I need tonight. Put in him what we need. Say, Lord, not just because of him, but in spite of him. Say, Lord, anoint him beyond measure for our sake. Beyond measure for our sake. What he has no point of reference for. What he has never seen before, what he has never known before, what he has never walked in before, what he has not, not even been aware was there to desire before. Baptize him with tonight. Let him speak and minister as a prophet and apostle to this house. Give him clarity, guidance, speed and accuracy to hit every prophetic chord in the realm of the spirit that needs to be hit. To touch every nerve that needs to be touched. To break everything that needs to be broken. Father, we believe that you are going to do exceedingly abundantly far above all he or we could ever ask or think or imagine in the name of your son Jesus. Now I want you to put your hands together with joy in your heart as I invite my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Mando sobre esta galagosta, cara. Spirit of the living God. Just lift up your right hand. Let's pray in the spirit. The Lord put a burden for the city in my heart this morning and stroke afternoon. And I just want us to take some time to pray for this, this city, particularly this community that this church is planted in. I believe something truly like Pastor said is going to break out from this church very shortly, very shortly. But there are contending spirits, there are territorial spirits that we must continuously after tonight pastors of this, of this center. The enemy has picked the signal of the next season of this church up in the realm of the spirit. So forces are beginning to gather against the transition. Tonight, I want us to pull down stronghold. Scripture says, blessed is he who has come in the name of the Lord. Tonight, I want us to declare that this church, the ministry through this church, is blessed for its next season in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and pray. Begin to declare. He says, Satan needs to know how blessed you are. He says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We declare in the name of Jesus, by the power in the blood of Jesus, that blessed is this church, blessed is this ministry, blessed is this movement. We speak to this community, we speak to territorial spirit, we speak to principalities and power that blessed is this church, blessed is this ministry, blessed are its pastors, blessed are its ministers. In the name of Jesus, we contend with every territorial spirit. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. We displace territorial authorities over this ministry against the progress against the advancement against the transitioning of this ministry we tear down we pull down we pull 
Gusta zeke de de bosta, recaste pre enga da bolo godoste, leke ke tu seke de godoste, lakando su su pre godoste. We come in the name of Jesus tonight. We declare kindaria basa ke de 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 bosta ka. Every form of resistance be broken in Jesus name. We speak to gate, the gate of principalities. Be open in the name of Jesus. Be destroyed. We are brutal. We destroy. We are brutal. We destroy in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of resistance. Eroshta kataya. Erusha. Erusha. Eruma. In katula. In gadrusha kadesha. In the name of Jesus. Lekakuri adiarosha. Mengadosha. Ri in katusa gadena na bosha kataya. Listen very carefully. One of the one of the demonic effects of gates is that it refuses for people to gather. The purpose of the church is to gather ones that are called out. But one of the demonic effect of gates is to what is to withhold the gathering. And I sense that part of the next movement of this church is to gather the lost, is to gather the lowly. But the gate operates in refusing to allow people to gather. Now we are going to speak uh, to every gate uh, resisting a gathering under this roof uh, to be destroyed tonight. Uh, come on, let's pray. Leko shakata baya, magarusha kate te peketeshta, ninko sukata neboko shakata. We command every gate, uh, every evil gate uh, against the gathering of God's people uh, under this tent. Uh, Broken to be destroyed tonight. Raka kota seket kete. We come against you. Evil gate. Mekasta. Makilia kete seketa. Magagado na ba shakata ya? Leko seketa pregedesha. Mekasta. Nika kuto seketa ba rosha. Leka kato poket. Raka kata ba. Mekosha. Makonya. Inda kuriata. Mekosha kata pagaya. We confront you uh, in the name of Jesus. La karakoto seket mekosha rinka kate pekete kete ha lekete de bonoch neka karokoche sakata ya. We pull you down in Jesus' name. Manga da 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 ba sakata ya. La kekete sakata lekose kete la gede de de bosha lekosha ranga da 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 bosha. Meka kata kata leko to se kete 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 makaro ko to se kete ha leka ando se te pe kete ra eto su kete la 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 bosha ra eka kata pa ya leke to su se lenge kre kete so kete meka kata la la ba ya sha ta we tear you down ha we pull you up ra ga da da la bosha we declare God will not touch. We declare gathering of God's people. Rakakato sekete kete, leko shaka pakata ya, lekando robe ne bosha. Rakakata, ra inkato sekete pegede ne, ra gaga da da ne bosha. Lekeshe ya, ra ekto sekete kete, ra inkaka da 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 ne bosha. Leko shaka tapaka ya, ra inkaka da 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 ne bosha. Meko sha, ra inkake keto pone kete, ra ingoro sha. Leko ta da 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 ne bosha. We tear you down. We pull you down. Rakata bara bara bosha. Kata da da da. Reketo soketa brekete bosha. Kata ya. Listen. In Psalm 24, David prophetically opens her eyes to spiritual transactions. When it comes to because sir, I believe so very strongly. I was praying because when God sends me to a place, and you will understand this because you carry an apostolic mandate. God sends us into city to join forces with ministries to take territories. This is not about church growth here. This is about taking city for the kingdom of God. This is about advancing the kingdom of God. Now, listen. David was speaking in Psalm 24, asking the gates, and of course, this is a word church, so I don't need to go into the, the significance of the gate and all that. But David was speaking to the gate, and the gate was speaking back. The gate was speaking back. The gate was challenging the prophetic utterance of the spirit. 
Lift up your head, oh you gate, for the king of glory to come in. And the gate spoke back. Who is this king of glory? He said, when it comes to the advancement of the kingdom of God, resistance is one of the proof that you are actually advancing the kingdom of God. And God is about to move truly this ministry into another level. But David shows us that when the gate speaks, you don't keep quiet. That's why I sense tonight that tonight we're going to do warfare. Certain things have been broken, but I think we need to get to tonight. We're going to take some more time to now speak to the gate. You see, like you said, you were just, I, I, what you said, I know you said to kind of introduce me, but you spoke how the church should be speaking. The devil needs to know how anointed we are. The devil needs to be reminded that he's defeated. The devil needs to know that God and Jesus is Lord over this community. So David spoke back and what and introduced. He knew who his God was, but the devil needs to have a reintroduction of who God is. So tonight, according to the scripture in, in Proverbs, it says, By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. And the bless means to pronounce certain decrees, you know what, over a city and to pronounce it over demonic attacks. So tonight we're going to open our mouth and we're going to declare, we're praying for this church now, concerning this church, we command you gate to be open for the king of glory into this community uh, that the people of God uh, may gather under his glory may gather unto the name of our Lord uh, go ahead and begin to speak uh, I hear Satan questioning this ch- who is the king of glory uh, now respond to him uh, speak to him tonight uh, introduce your God introduce your vision to him uh, introduce your to him uh, you are sent here uh, you are sent here uh, Tell him what you are sent to uh, Remind him of the backing of God. I sit and get his hands off your health. Rakat la bosha rete te seke te pregere bosha le koshe le kosha min koshe kerias me bosha katele ya bere le bosha soko te pregere de le bosha le peka te da 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 le bosha me kore boko seka da 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 ba thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you jesus le kosha katara da ba The Lord spoke to me concerning a few people here. But so far, he's only released me to speak to one person here. And then, probably during the course of the service, I would feel a release to go into other things. But the reason why I feel he's released me to to minister now is because of what Pastor did say. And I showed it to my brother, Pastor Tindy, who introduced him in a few minutes. But the Lord showed me clearly about someone's academic under attack. And you did mention somebody's project. You know, you did mention that. But he showed me clearly. And the funny thing is that everyone God spoke to me about God showed me their picture and their agenda. Now God ministers in mysterious ways so it can be more than one person. But I know there's a lady here, your education, your academics is under attack. And God has asked me to release grace into that situation. If you're here, just raise your hand wherever you are. Who is that lady? I saw you clearly. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Leko shadadadabusha kataya. Mendo suzu bregedegedelushna kataya. The Lord said to me, at this point, you need favor. At this point, you see, there's no, there's no human effort. But that his name may be glorified in your life. He has asked me to release grace into that situation and let me tell you something the Lord said to you there's no need to worry he has stepped in grace is speaking on your behalf 
the favor of God has brought you through I'm telling you the truth you will testify concerning your academics now let me tell you something that you may know that this is God a job will come readily after your graduation it will be waiting for you says the spirit of the Lord so fear not he has taken over he has taken over in the name of Jesus if you are here as well and you just you are struggling with your academics favor is speaking on your behalf grace is speaking on your behalf in the precious name of Jesus Christ could you take your seat tonight and let's just give God a praise let's just celebrate God for this glorious night it's going to be an awesome night it's going to be an awesome night I'm so glad to be here tonight I really appreciate being here tonight like pastor said uh, it only takes um, the connection between I and him and I believe the grace of God for me to be here tonight. Apart from the fact that I'm just also returning a couple of days and still need to be with my family, physically speaking, physically speaking, I am, I am I'm tired, to be honest. <laughs> this will be my 14th preaching in two and a half weeks. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, and this is interstate. It's not just being in one place and some of the places we had this meeting it's not like 45 minutes preaching it's a revival meeting there's a holy ghost meeting so you are there there's counseling to be done there's meetings to be done there's you know all sort of things but like pastor said and i said to my brother on the way that if i had received this invitation after we came back from nigeria i would have thought an element of flesh was in it but pastor invited me to come without having to have seen anything. It would have been the spirit of God. I told him. I told him. Because when it comes to the things of the kingdom, I don't mess about with it. I'm very straight. And I told him, I said, I would have sensed an element of flesh. You know, because sometimes it's easy to be moved by what you see. But this meeting is not about what anyone saw. It's about what we heard. And that's why I believe God is permitted us to be here tonight. You know, and I appreciate you, sir. I really do appreciate you. Indeed, you are not a friend, you are a brother, you know, kindred spirit. You know, today I was speaking to my other brother in Scotland, in Glasgow, who passages spoke about. And we were just, you know, talking about the goodness of God. And it mentioned to me, he said, a pastor wanted him to preach for him sometime soon. And he was not going to be able to make it because he was traveling outside of the country to, to minister. And he said, you know what? I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make it. And, and the guy said, oh, but I really want to. I think I'm going to have to move this meeting. Uh, but, you know, my people have been talking about inviting one pastor to come. But really and sincerely, I don't know this guy. And I don't, but they've just been going on about, you know what, get this guy, you know, bring this guy and all of that. And he said, you know what, because I don't know this guy, I don't want to bring him. Maybe we'd have to meet, move the meeting to when you are back. And he said, who is this guy? Guess what? Pastor Lumide. <laughs> And Pastor Shagu said, that's my brother. Get him. In fact, if you want me to call him right now, I'm going to call him. You need to bring that guy. In fact, you know what? Get him instead of me. And, and that's a sign that sir, God is doing something. It's indeed a level of transition. And he kept on. He said, you know what? This guy is my brother. In fact, if it's proving difficult to get through to him, let me know. I'll call him straight away. You know what? And he said, you know what? Maybe you guys are going to have to do it together. And, and I just felt so excited that we don't know where these things have been spoken about. Sometimes we're here, we're laboring, we're doing what we're doing, but God is already manifesting his works. God is already, you know what, connecting hearts together. Do you get? And, and who knew? You know what? Pastor Olimide and Pastor Shagun just met even though they met, you know, before now, you know, virtually, but they met physically and there was a connection. And, and, and look at what is already happening. And I just want to encourage this house that God is doing something through this house. You know, and it's very unique. And I'm not saying this because I just want to hype him. No, but I believe, because let me tell you something like you said. I am destined to meet great people. And for me to be here tonight, you are great. There's greatness in this ministry. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not blowing my trumpet, but it's my destiny. You know, you don't find eagles, you know what, in the same level with other birds. You get uh, when, when the eagle has a class of his own. You know what? And I have a spiritual identity of an eagle. And that is why nothing short of greatness, nothing short of, of, of great things 
I've been in my way, you know, since I came into Christ. So for me to be here tonight, I know that, you know, what well, you guys are heading somewhere. And on top of that, God spoke to me about you. But we'll get into that in a few minutes. I'm here today with my brother. He's my prayer partner. I love this guy to pieces. He's a great, humble man of God. Anointed minister, anointed teacher of God's word. Would you celebrate Pastor Tunde around one day with me, you know, this evening? I, at some point in time, when we begin to lead prayer, it would you know, come up as we pray and minister to people and he'll just worship in song while high and pastor just minister, you know, as God leads us, you know, in, in, in the course of the service. But sincerely, I'm really humbled to be here tonight. Tonight, I, I want to speak. I'm in the right place. And I can identify with what um, threshing floor, you know, you know, it's all about because a couple of years ago, long before we started our church in London, um, we, we, we God led us to start a, a, a prophetic uh, prayer outreach ministry that we called Encounter UK. And for about a year plus, we gathered, you know what, in a building in, the, in London to pray for this nation. We prayed for city I'd never been before in my life. And we, we had, we had out-of-body experiences in those meetings where God will take us. We had a map. We had populations of every city, 66 of them to be precise, that makes up the whole of the United Kingdom. And we would have out-of-body experiences where God will take us out of London into places like Manchester, into places like Dundee. And we will see the intervention of our prayer. We will see our prayer stopping things. We will see our prayer, you know what, you know what, causing things to happen. I remember one of the encounters we had after we had prayed for about a year half and God instructed us to go on a UK prayer tour and we began to travel around city partnering with churches and, and raising prayer altars over every city that God has permitted us to go so far. I remember when we were in Glasgow, we prayed in Glasgow on a, on a Saturday and, and we flew our team there. Some of us even, some people even drove eight and a half hours to get to Scotland to just pray and we partnered with other churches to lead that prayer encounter and we, we, the next day, the following week it was, it was in the news that um, this guy, I've forgotten his name, one of these hip hop guys from America, I think Neo or something was going to come and have a show in Glasgow that week and he was refused the visa to come in there because God had given us a word that this city belongs to him and there's going to be a revival in this city and that is why I understand because you see you know, I'm very comfortable. I, 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 I know sometime I might be invited to, to, to minister at your breakthrough um, conference or a prayer meeting but I would always want to come back to Trash and Floor because of the mandate I carry. Because, you see, we need to begin to understand God wants to bless us. Like I tell our church, God wants to bless you much more than you want to be blessed. But I understand that, you see, one of the reasons for which we are called out, Ecclesia, from the nations of African nations or wherever we are from into this city is for such a time as this. And we must understand, you know what, the apostolic mandate on each and every one of us. And the time is running out. We must understand why we're here. And that is why when it comes to meeting for us to take charge and authority over the city of God, I want to be there. I don't have anything against, you know, what being in meetings that, what, that will advance us in what in the blessings of God. I understand the blessing. I am a very, very great teacher when it comes to working in the blessings of God and not all this mess that people are doing. But when it comes to understanding our assignment for such a time as this, for us to understand that we are not just a bride to a king, but we are a deliverer of nations. Uh, we must understand that even as a wife, you are a purpose-driven wife. And so the church has lost its sense of what of its purpose for which it was created. So every time we have an opportunity, and do you know one thing I've discovered? Even in those meetings that we hold, even though our focus and our concentration is in revival in the land and upholding the land, breakthroughs happen in those meetings. That is why when I was praying for this meeting, God was showing me how he was going to bless some people here. God was already intervening in other people's situation. That's why God could minister to people's education. Why? Because he cares for you. But you begin to see the heart of God towards you when his heartbeat becomes your heartbeat. Several years ago, I was praying and I began to pray. I didn't know I was setting myself up before I relocated from Nigeria. I was praying one morning. I said, Lord, put your body in my heart. Whatever burdens you, let it burden me. I didn't know I did the greatest mistake of my life. My friend, <laughs> my friend once described me. You know, one of my good friends, you know, someone that I, I told you about him doing great things in Nigeria in his ministry. And he said, Femi, I've watched you over the years. And this is the only way I can define who you are. There are some people who carry their vision around. And there are some people who their vision carry them. He said, you are the kind of person your visions carry you. You have no life of your own anymore. It is the burden of the Lord that has become your body. It will cost to carry the burden of the Lord, but it is blessed. You know, it's a blessed life to carry the burden of the Lord. And that is why I'm happy to be here. 
That is why I don't mind, you know what, the tiredness to be here tonight because the moment Pastor shared the vision of this night with me, my heart just went out for it because I have a genuine body for the land. You know, we, we, we have done so many things in this country to want to advance the kingdom of God, but it did not work. Why? Because God had not yet brought me into a place where I had a genuine love for the land. And one morning I was praying and God said to me, Femi, it's time. Arise. He said, because now I know that you have a genuine love for the land. Now your work can prosper. Now I can establish you in the land because you know what it takes. Scripture says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem for those who love her may prosper. And so there is a love that must be the foundation and the bedrock of our pursuit of advancing the kingdom or advancing our own life here in this country for God to honor it. And I sense there's a genuine love for this country. There's a genuine love for this, for this land in this ministry. So tonight I just want to quickly speak on what I've tied to the, the purpose-driven church. The purpose-driven church. And tonight we just want to look at God's, what is God's intention. How does revival? Because I, I believe that we stand in a time that um, the revival has started. But we would not see more of its manifestation until the church come into certain perspective. And tonight, I'm, I, I'm not going to be sharing what you've not heard before. But I believe tonight is just to challenge ourselves just in case we've lost our focus or something has shifted somewhere. And to remind ourselves of the things we already know to challenge us to continue the race Maybe some of us are already wearing out because the Bible gives, you know, did say, do not be wearing well doing. It's not easy to advance the kingdom of God. It's not easy to live the life that God wants us to live. Everything is coming against us. Even Jesus said in the world, you have tribulations. You know, he said, the gate of hell will not prevail against my church. It means that we're in contention every time we stand to do something for the kingdom of God. So when we go through those things, sometimes we may become weary and just lose sight of what is most important. We are all there. We all go through seasons every now and then. You know, so tonight I just want us to call our attention back to certain important truths that will re-energize us, recuperate us to go further in the things that God has called us to do. So, let's turn our Bibles to Ephesians 2. Ma, I celebrate you. Thank you very much. Because I know if you have said no to your husband, I won't be here, no matter how much we love each other. Praise the Lord. So, thank you for saying yes. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Let's look at Ephesians 3. And I just want to preach contextually tonight. I'm not going to be reading a lot of scripture. But I just want us to take one verse, you know, that just kind of, you know, um, 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 summarizes the heart of God for his church. And when I mean the church, of course, like I said, it's a word church. You know, I'm not talking about the building. Thank God for the name of this mini ecclesia called out one, set apart. That's what the church of God says. It's from the Greek word ecclesia, which means a called out ones. We are called out, set apart for what for a cause of the kingdom. And so, so when we're talking about church, we're talking about people here. I'm talking about you, I'm talking about myself. So look at what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. He says, to this, to the intent. Now, that's talking about intention. And when you're talking about intention, purpose comes in. Because the intent in the heart of someone is what gives, you know what, a particular cause and purpose. What is my intention for creating a chair? Is to what, is to what, is to create something that can seat you. In other words, that seat has got a purpose because of my intent. So the Bible here, according to Paul, is showing us what the intent of God is for us as called out ones. So it says here, it says to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by who? So God has got something that without the active role or the active involvement of the church may never come to light. It may never come to light. The church, side by side with God, will, will enable certain things that God has in mind for humanity to be made known, to be revealed, to be possible, to be manifested. That's why the Bible says that the world earnestly waits what? For the manifestations of why? Because we have a role to play. Any vision, listen very carefully, any vision that put total dependency on God is not a vision from God. 
God has always walked side by side with man. And that is why, like no other time, the church must arise. The church must take its place. Not in a beggarly position that we assume now. But in an authoritative position because we are co-workers. We are partners. The scripture that says with God, all things are possible. It's not saying, you know what, in a beggarly attitude, begging God. The word with there means it was as an undertone of in synergy with God. In partnership with God, then all things becomes possible. Unfortunately today, the church has taken what a beggarly posture. Begging God. Waiting on God. When the Bible says that the kingdom of God is within us, we have what it takes. Because that is what God has intended for us, the church, from day one. And we must come back to that place. And that is why when we're talking about revival, we're not talking about a move of God in the building. We're talking about, you know what, man taking his place alongside God and what and doing, advancing the kingdom of God at all costs. Men who would not love their lives unto death. Why? Because they understand that they are in partnership. And once you sign a partnership agreement, you know what? You committed. All the way you committed. So we must wake up. We must get out of this beggarly position that many of us in the church today, many of us in the body of Christ, has what a subject ourselves to. It's an insult on God when God is saying, I have not seen the Son of Man beg. And then we now subject ourselves to a beggarly posture. When we're supposed to be taking authority, when we're supposed to be taking charge, we were given dominion, we were given the authority. Everything God did put on that man, now man is putting himself under everything. And then the church is following suit. But I see a new people. That is why there's a that is why there has to be a church like this. That is why there has to be a pastor like this. That is why there has to be a pastor like this. See, we are in a generation that is faceless but is forceful. Trust me, we are not see gone are the days of the generation of men who are seeking face. We may not be known. I don't care. I don't want to be in those places. But you know what? I want to move things on behalf of God. And we live in those days of lamb lights. If that is all that we seek, we've just missed it out. We've just, we sang a song or we took, you know, like a phrase and said, God, don't pass me by. Don't, don't pass me by. You see, God will only take note of you when you are positioned. We read of Zacchaeus. There were so many people there that Jesus did not take note of. But this guy understands positioning to get God's attention. And the way many of us in the church are positioned today, not because God has a heart of evil, not because God does not care. He says he will not leave us nor forsake us, but I all know understand spiritual position. And when you are wrongly positioned, you may miss God. You may miss the move of God. And that is why my prayer this afternoon was, Lord, do not let us miss your move. Do not let us move. And you know the move that, you know, we should be praying not to, not to miss it's not the move of God in a meeting. It's the move of God through our lives. You know, I had a tribute that was given, that was made to Bethany the house through T.L. Osborne. And that one word has stuck with me for a couple of years now. And that's my pursuit, sir. He said, Bethany the house was a man that God did not suffer limit in. How many of us? How many? Christians today is God's suffering limit. God cannot stretch out his hands because we refuse to stretch out our hands. God cannot heal the sick because we refuse to step out in faith and pray for the sick. He's so boxed in us. It's, it's limited. Our God is an unlimited God, but when because God has decided through his infinite wisdom and mercy to walk through men, we have limited the world, the capacity in which God wants to operate in. And that is why our church is suffering today. That is why the body of Christ is suffering today. I'm, that's why I said I'm excited that it is stretching floor that God has, has, has permitted me to minister tonight because I know that we know business. We know what we are here tonight. You know, so I find liberty to minister under this prophetic unction because we're here for revival. 
We're here to what to re-energize ourselves and to what and to take the city, to take the nation, to take the world, the mountains for God. Because you see, it's so it's so you see, there's some scripture that is so good to quote. One of my personal prophetic scriptures is Isaiah chapter 2. In that day, the house of the, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be exalted above every other mountain. And what and what people shall say, let us go into the house of the Lord, for we shall be taught the way of the Lord. I said, all nations will flow into it. But let me tell you something. It is not the edifice that is attracting people. Because if you look at some of these X, uh, X factor stages, it's far better than some of the things we see in our church. So if it's the edifice, I think we failed. But it is what is going in there. Because the message translation says we shall be shown the way we ought to live, not told shown, modeling. There's a difference between telling and showing. When you tell someone something and it's not modeled, it doesn't have impact on them. That's why Ora Robert said a message is something that you know while a sermon is a message that has been lived. So something must happen in the church. I don't know, but I know I and my brother, we believe that the church is the hope of revival in these last days. That's why I'm sold out to the church. At any level, two, three, four, five, six. You can know when people carry the spirit of God. I preach to one, people, one person like I preach to thousands of people. And I've been privileged around the world to preach to thousands of people in meetings. It doesn't move me. Numbers don't move me. It's the agenda of God that moves me. That's why my friend says, your vision carries you. If Moving the kingdom requires me to minister in t shirt and shorts all the way, man. I'm glad. <laughs> yes, there are people you can't reach out with in all these things we wear. No. Our ministry reaches out to some Hispanic community, about 12 nations, Hispanic community in, in, in US. I don't minister like this to them, they're not going to allow me when I minister to these people. I'm the only black person there. But these people understand one of the, one of the culture of, of Hispanic people is family, is family. I don't have orders. Whatever they eat, they eat. I eat. Most of the time, they're in shorts. So I don't go there like this because I wouldn't be able to come into the community. Yeah. And then we see things happen year in, year out, year in, year out. Why? Because you know what? It's the kingdom of God. It's not how I look. It must compel. Paul said, I have become all things to all men that I may what? Get more. Oh, get more. I'm not saying that we should begin to take on the form of the world, but we must understand the wisdom to what to operate in those places. So something must happen to the church. So the revival of this nation or any nation in this generation will experience praise God will not be battered by individuals but through collective effort which is the church of God so that is why we must get rid of this individualism we see a set of people ministering and why we hear not here and I'm just saying the things we've seen around some people are trying to outshine themselves You know, I, I'm privileged to write article in one of the Christian newspapers in the, in the UK and I started writing on a book I'm working on titled The Laws of Darkness. And I shared six laws of darkness that put the Christian to an advantage point, you know, but that's not my message. But I want to say something that ties to what I'm saying. And one of the things I did mention in that article and in the book is that the reason why we do not see things work, even though the, Jesus said, let men see your good work. Because it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a criteria. It's a prerequisite for people to honor God. We must have good works. It's because we spend too long a time around what already works. So, because, see, without darkness, light is irrelevant. So, we are all good. This is not the place to try to show your good works. Go in the city center. Show your good works there. And men will give glory to God. This is not the place to show our good works. 
that we find ourselves here, we already have a good walk. So let's leave all these things alone. When you stand in the city center and begin to give God glory, he says, if I be lifted up, people will be drawn to God. Your light will shine because why naturally, the Bible says in John chapter 1, this light shines in, not outside or around darkness, in darkness. So the quickest way to your success is to embrace the pain of humanity. Business, ministry, quickest way. Look for where the trouble is and go there. You will realize that it doesn't take sweat. It doesn't take sweat. We sweat because you know what? There's no room. But when God gives you room, there's no room for sweat. It's somebody following me. So it's going, not going to be done by individuals. Let's get rid of, you know what? The light must be on me. You heard what my brother said? We were there ministering. We, no, it doesn't matter. We're not waiting for one person. Oh, let me size him up and see what he has to do. No. We were just saying, exchange. We, in fact, we, we, we scattered the whole order. The moment I came up the pooping like this, the Lord spoke to me. He said, hand over straight away to pastor. And immediately I, hand over. From there, God spoke to me to call another son, not even the guest minister. It's the spirit of unity. The wind blows where it wills. And you must understand, it's one of the strengths of the ego. He catches up with the wind. Other birds do not understand plugging into the wind. That's why they flap and struggle. But when we understand, like he said tonight, every minister must learn how to interpret each service. We can pray over our agenda, but the spirit blows as it wills. And if we cannot catch up in the wind and the church, and that's where the struggle is, we don't understand the prophetic movement of the wind, so we cannot catch up with what, the, what God is doing. And that is why we are trying to do our own stuff. It's taking a lot of time. Time is running out. It's running out on us. That's why we must catch the essence of what threshing floor. We must catch it. We can't come here with our own agenda. There's an agenda for this. And that's why I'm glad that it's not a place where ministers just go up and down all of that. Because see, it can be watered down. Everybody has an agenda. And that's why I said I'm glad this invitation came before we ministered together in Nigeria. We're not hungry preachers. <laughs> so it's time for the church of God everywhere in every nation to wake up to God's original intention for establishing the church. There's no way we will see revival today unless the right perspective of the church is fully formed in us, followers of Christ. Now listen to this. Revival is easy when God intended, for what God intended the church, when it is what God has established it for. Unfortunately, it is not so for many Christians, such as, for so, so many reasons. I don't want to go into that. It's not what we want to go for. So many reasons we're not going to see revival as fast as it, we want to. Now, let me say this because this is really born in my heart. We must understand there's a prophetic agenda for this nation that must be fulfilled. And God is looking to you and I for its fulfillment. When Jesus Christ was here in person, he preserved the earth from decadence. But now Jesus says, we are the salt that will preserve the earth. But unfortunately, the reverse is the case. The church is no longer the model for the world. It is the world that has become the standard for the church. And this is one of the things that we must with every might in us fight against. We cannot dance to the tune of the world. When Jesus was leading on his prayer, it was clear, the original plan. He says, let your will be done on earth as it is in the heaven. In other words, the kingdom of God must be the standard of living in this world. We cannot bring the tune of the world into the church. Otherwise, we will lose our authority and our right to contend with what the world system that's why Jesus said, if the God of this world come, he will find nothing in me. We cannot bring anything that belongs to Babylon in here and expect to do what to bring Babylon down. And that is why we have been beaten black and blue every time because there is a seed of the world in us that we must get rid of. And so, see, let me tell you something. That is why, you see, we, we, we are actually taking a team in one of the prayer meetings that that whole month, the prayer meeting, we are looking at what the threshing floor. And you see, the threshing floor is a place of separation. Sir, see, let me tell you something. For, I, I, I know this is, going, this, this is a movement and it's going to spread. But you know what? Be, see, what we, what we say here 
is a sign that you are touching something. It's a ground of separation. It is not called to the crowd. It is shaft from with. God separates. And the remnant is not always much. And that is why, see, let me tell you something. You are seated here, not because you were unchosen, not because you were selected, but because you are elected. It has nothing to do with you. It's not about favorism here. We are talking about a remnant that has been separated. Let me tell you something. It's not going to take a billion people to change the world. It's going to take a few people who carry the spirit of God, who understand the mandate of the kingdom, and who carry the heart of Jesus. Are we going to go out there faceless but forceful? Are we going to pull things down? So when we're talking about trash and floor, it's not for the crowd. The crowd will come, but I'm telling you, many will fall out. It's hard work. It's hard work. Because sometimes we're going to come here and we're going to have to lay down prayer for six hours. Nothing is going to change. I'm telling you the truth. That's what it's all about. Amen. When we were having our prayer meeting, we don't raise offerings there. I'm telling you, we went to Birmingham to pray. We told the pastor, this is his personal instruction God gave to me. That's it. Revival is, is one, of the, one, of the, one of the shoulders upon which revival rests is sacrifice. So for us, God told us, you will have to pay for revival. My brother is here. We never raised offering. We paid for the buildings. We paid for our trips individually. We flew some people, drove eight and a half hours. We went to pray in Birmingham. And we told the pastor, see, we will pay for the venue if the venue is public. We sent all the publicity material. We sent everything there. Please, this is an instruction from God. But when the pastor saw the crowd, I'm sure he must have had an head count, even if it is five pounds. And all of a sudden, her husband came up and took off. Oh, <laughs> something rose in me. Nah, not under my watch. And I rose up and I said to them, one of the costs of revival is sacrifice. I said, we've run this ministry three years, we've not raised one offering. And I want to tell you tonight, the offering that was raised here tonight has nothing to do with us. She raised it, it remains here. See, we left, she couldn't look me in the face. I'm not going to condone in discipline when it comes to the things of the kingdom of God. I don't care. I don't need to come back. I wasn't begging to come to your church. I'm not looking for a meeting. We came with our team. We drove down from London to come and pray in your city. To join hands with you to want to raise a prayer altar for your city. And you want to insult God with offering of how much? And I gave my heart, my piece of my heart to all the people. She couldn't look me in the face till today. She's not called me or replied me. I don't care. It's true, I don't care. But we must, the church should not be the problem. We are problem solvers. When we become the problem, is there's no hope anymore. So that's why something must happen to the church. That's why Jesus said, to this intent that the manifold wisdom of God may be made known by the church to principalities and to powers. Amen. These are things that govern our cities, govern our nations. You know what shape our culture, shape our thinking pattern. And if the church does not become involved, actively involved, then already there's no way that we will not dance to the tune of the world. Because we're not we've given them the authority to do whatever they want to do. So our thinking pattern is what is structured by what? By the what? By the, by the principalities and powers. You know, governing, you know, what these heavenly places. I'm, the scripture there is very clear because every office, the Bible says in Romans 13, is God ordained. So when he says of heavenly places, he's not talking about spiritual realm. He's talking about every seat of power is heavenly because it's meant to be what? To be, what, to be sat with, with sacred, what, with its mentality of sacredness there. That's why it's called heavenly. So let's don't, let's don't miss this point out that these places that shape and govern society, govern the thinking of man, should be involved. The church should be actively involved in it. That's what we call that and set apart. For this purpose. For this purpose. So God is looking to us. Now from this scripture we've read three important intentions that must become our intention as the church. Number one, make known his ways. To make known the manifold wisdom. And if you read the previous scripture, Paul was introducing one of his assignments is to what is to bring comprehension and enlightenment and to make known the mysteries of the things of the kingdom to the church. 
that's a man who understands his assignment. And that is the assignment of every individual in the body of Christ to make known the way of the Lord. What is the way of the Lord? The Bible tells us the way of the Lord is justice, is peace, is forgiveness, is holiness, is righteousness. And these are the things that what that what that shapes what a nation. Fair deal, equality, justice. And we as Christians cannot fall short of that. Today I'm telling you the truth. And you will agree with me that there are people who are afraid to do business with Christians. So if people are afraid to do business with us, how do we get into those industry and what and change it and use its resources to advance the kingdom of God? Well, you know what? We are a threat to the business world because of our what, lack of integrity and character. Because that's the way of the Lord. He spoke about God's integrity. When God says it's 9 o'clock, he shows up at 9 o'clock, God will not come late because you know what? God is a man of integrity. That is the way of the Lord. We're not talking about getting to your office place and koro boko shakadabada. It's not the way of the Lord. You can koro boko shakadabada, but every day you keep calling, I'm running late, I'm running late, I'm running late, I'm running late. Your tongue doesn't change anything. It is your character that changes things. That is the only way there can be a revival in our land, when we make known the way of God, God is not a cheat. God is not a robber. God is not into deception. Now. It's yes, it is yes. It's no, it is no. That is the way of God. When Satan appeared to Jesus Christ and says, if you are the son of man, why not turn this stone into bread? Now, Jesus did not, not because he didn't, under, he didn't have power, but when people were hungry because he understood justice uh, and he understands that, you know what, power is for equality, power is to what? Is to make the needy have, he turned bread, he multiplied bread. It wasn't because he didn't have power to change stone into bread, but he understands that, you know what, power is not to be abused. Uh, power is for the less privileged, power is for the needy, power is for the hungry. It is the way of the Lord. And that's what he did. Setting a standard that we have the authority of God to do what? To change lives. To make known the way of God. Because Jesus said, he only said this to his disciples to test them because he himself knew what he will do. We must know the way of the Lord. We must make the way of the Lord known. That is the only way those people out there can know God. Because it is our assignment to make the way known. It's not to be cursing them. The scripture did not say the intent of the church is to be cursing them. It's to make his way known. When we make his way known, they will submit. You see, I don't know about you, but I read something in the scripture that just become a lifetime prayer. And that is why when you said at a conference in Nigeria, it's still on my DP. You gave a prophetic word and said, somebody here is seated in parliament making decisions. You were speaking to me because I've always known this. I knew it when I read the scripture that the king of the land came to Elijah and said, Sal, how are we going to move this nation forward? I said, that is me. I carry a prophetic mandate on my life. The government should come to ask prophet for the way. That was the divine order from scratch. We changed it. <laughs> Prophets were the one that ruled the nation. <laughs> Not kings. Prophets. Priests. Help God to move a nation forward. When I read that, it became a lifetime process. When you saw it, I know it was me. I don't know why I wrote it. It's still there on my DP. It's there on my DP. Seated in parliament, ash decision maker. I know where. I know. I know. This thing you must know. You must know. So when he said it, I said, thank you for reminding me again, sir. <laughs> yes. It's still there. Over one week now. Because it's my life. I know, I know that I'm not only called to the church, I'm called to what to reform the world. So if I want to reform the world, I cannot be talking to pastors alone. I can't. I can't. So that word wasn't for everybody. Uh, we know we that we were there, we know who it was. It's true. So we must understand the things God has called us to do. We must know to make his will. Secondly, in Matthew 16, Jesus said, I give to you the keys of the kingdom. We are custodians of divine mysteries. The keys of the kingdom are mysteries ordained for glory. The nation cannot come into the world, into a manifestation of the glory of God when the church is not operating in the world, in what? In mysteries. 
Paul said they were hidden, but made revealed to us for what? For the glory of the church. So he said, I give to you the keys of the kingdom. Jesus would not have sent us as his church without equipping us. And part of what we're equipped with is mysteries, is truth. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. That is why the church must be custodians of this truth. Because what will set our nation free, what will set these people free, is the truth that they know. And when the house of God is void of the truth, we just want to create more captives. And captives cannot sing. That is why we hear testimonies like when I came into this church and through the teachings one of our members in our church told me he said before I joined your church my offering does not go past a pound if there was a mighty move in the church two pound <laughs> what <laughs> seriously I'm telling you the truth seriously <laughs> That if there was a move of the spirit that triggers more annoying, more giving, it's too powerful. I vowed that no pastor would take my offering. Now, this lady gives you now thousands now. Because we are in custody of the truth that delivers. He says, So I give to you the keys of the kingdom, and that was after Jesus spoke about the church in Matthew chapter 16. Upon this I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I give to you the keys of the kingdom, which is the mysteries, the truth, which is the pillar of what of the church. And that is why the Bible says in these days knowledge will grow. Unfortunately, it's working against us because we do not know how to sift the knowledge that we, what we expose ourselves to. So that's the third intention. The church must become the custodian of mysteries that deliver us. That's why Proverbs tells us where there is no vision, what happens? The people perish. But I like what the Amplifier says. He said, where there is no redemptive revelation. Redemptive. Not just chatterbox. Truth that redeems. Authentic. That redeems. That saves. That delivers. That rescues. Number three thing. He said, whatsoever you bind on earth, Shall what? The third thing is to meet the need of human for of the health of human of mankind. Whatsoever you bind on that, the same thing that Jesus God told Abraham to have dominion and authority over the earth, not to dominate, but to do what to meet the need. When God called Adam to begin to give names to the animals. What God was doing was to demonstrate the ability of man to meet a need. Name is not what you are called, it's your identity. One of the greatest needs of our generation is lack of identity. It's one of the greatest needs. And God was demonstrating the ability is put in man to meet a crucial need in creation. So it wasn't just giving names to the animal, it was what meeting a crucial when people do not have the right identity, they misuse their life. And our identity should be that which God has destined us to be. That is why a nation or a people or a community without God has a mistaken identity because we will never know the true words that we have. That is why we will chase the shadows. That is why we will result into a rat race mentality because we do not know who we are. So one of the needs that we call to meet is the need of what? Of restoring through identity to the nation. To the people. And that's why the first need God had to meet in the life of Adam was to let him know his identity. And God created man in his own image and after his likeness. First, you must know where you're from. 
That's why, you know, if, uh, Psalm, is it Psalm 82 and 19 that says, you die like men, men, because you do not know that you are God. Lack of identity is an abuse of life. And what it does is that it's to relegate human beings to survival living, which is the lowest level of life, abuse of life. Because you're only living to survive. And the church is called to meet that particular need. Particularly in this age, young people do not know who they are. They have a mistaken identity. That is why they want to look like a rapper. They have no identity of themselves. Beauty is not exposing yourself. That's not what beauty is. That's why our ministry in Nigeria, we reach out to young girls. We just finished the conference, just girls. Where we just talk to girls. Because all sort of things are happening right now and girls are just losing their lives because first of all, they've lost their identity. That's what happened to Esau. Esau did not lose his right. He first lost his identity. He didn't know who he was in his father's house. Wow. How can you be a son of that kind of man and you are hungry? These guys have mates. And if you understood his position, he should know that a couple of chapters away, he would inherit everything his father had, including mates. He can eat porridge as many times as he likes without blinking. Porridge in the morning, porridge in the afternoon, porridge in the night. <laughs> but he did not, he lost his identity and he lost his right. We don't have a right. That's why Jesus was bold enough to say, this is who he was. I'm the son of God. I'm the son of God. I am my father, we are one. What was he doing? Because he knew that his identity is where his authority was. Once he lost that, he lost his authority. So you can't afford to lose your identity. The church should not lose its identity because we are trying to advance the kingdom of God. We lose our identity. And what we are doing is that we lack the authority now to change that which we are losing our identity for. I don't have to speak like them to impact them. All I need to speak like is to speak like my God. It is his voice that breaks yokes. So once I can master the voice of God, that's what I need. That's all I need. He's working for me all over the world. <laughs> um, one nation, they're, they're enjoying. They're getting blessed, being delivered. Because why? Once I carry God, it's, it's over. It's over. So I don't need to lose it. That's why in whatever state I am, you know, I was listening to Bethany in the house uh, sometimes ago, in Atlanta, preaching in a large garden of white people. And he was preaching on a message and he, he, he said something that uh, only him can say. He said, what if we are trying to rebuke God and God refused to rebuke? <laughs> and people were, all the white men were looking at him. He said, if you are looking for English here, you won't get grammar here. But if you are looking for power, there's power here. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but my own ministry have not gone to that level. I, I won't say that for now, you know. <laughs> I know we've enjoyed a certain level of favor in the U.S., but not now. But doesn't care. Things are happening, man. Because this guy carries God. He may not carry the identity of a professor, but he carries God. Yeah. He professor, he, how many professors are hungry today? <laughs> so Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth. The word bind comes in two forms. One as a verb, which means to tie up. We find that in Isaiah 61. To bind means to tie up. The broken hearted. It means to amend what has been broken. So we have a mandate to, to amend what is broken things are broken. The family is oh my God. Oh my God. God said to bind, to tie back, to amend, to repair. So many things are broken. I'm telling that's why it, you see that's why God will not forgive me if I don't release that book on laws of darkness. I'm telling you the truth. You know, one of the one of the commendations on the website of the newspaper, I read one that just said, you know, a guy who must just do what God, as in no matter how busy you are, the guy said, finally, somebody is thinking in this world when he reads two of the articles or three of the articles on laws of darkness. Somebody says, finally, I found somebody thinking in this nation. Now, that really touched my heart. Another guy said, I found a piece for my project work. Because the truth is, whether at business level, at ministry level, G, Isaiah says, gross darkness. Now, the word darkness there is from the root word koshek, which means ignorance, which means mystery, 
which means debt, poverty. The things that we sit down and complain about is your source of breakthrough. But because of God, the Bible says, greater is the light that we shine. And Jesus said, you are the light. So when others are running away and talking down on darkness, it's your opportunity. It's a stage. It's a platform for you to shine. It's a platform. It's a platform. Let me tell you something. The effectiveness of a projecting system is in darkness, isn't it? You want to see the effect of the projector? No matter how beautiful a chandelier is, if you put a hang a chandelier in the light, forget about it. Or put a chandelier in what in a, in, a, in a slightly dark place, and you see the beauty, the grandeur of the crystals. Why? Because the power of light is when it is exposed in darkness. So he said to bind up, which is to tie up, and the second one is as a noun, which means to what to. Which means to tie down, which is to what to lose, to grant freedom. To lose, to grant freedom. There are many people bound in our, in our community, in this nation, that needs to be granted freedom. Now, I want to say a couple of things about understanding revival. There can't be a revival in this nation until there's a revival in the church. Man's greatest need is God, not cars, not houses. Man's greatest need. That is why the gospel is relevant both to the poor and to the rich, the black and the white. Because man's greatest need is God. Whether he has money or not, if he doesn't have God, he has nothing. So there can't be a world, a revival in any nation until there's a revival in the church. There can't be a revival in the church until there's a revival amongst the members. Neither can there be a revival amongst the members until there's a revival in the leadership. There can't be a revival in the leadership until there's a revival in the pastors. And neither can there be a revival in the pastors until there's a revival in the set man. But when you talk about set man, we're not just talking about the guy who stands here. Every one of us, we are set men. Whether in the marketplace or within the church, spiritual sphere. All this applies at all levels. You may be a team head, you have people working under you. And you must realize that what happens with you is what happens with the rest of the people. And that is one true fact about revival. It starts from someone. It starts from someone and others what get ignited. And that is why every one of us, we must be a candidate for revival. We must seek revival in our own individual lives. This is the time that we must stop seeking revival in a meeting, but seeking revival in our individual lives. When we catch the fire, it was Charles uh, John Wesley that says, all I do is to set myself on fire and others come to watch me burn. Because they were asking him, how do you do these things that you do? How do you get so many people healed? How do you get the people to gather? He says, all I do is to set myself on fire and others come to watch me burn. You don't need to give out leaflets to alert your neighbors that your house is on fire. Everybody sees your house is on fire. Even the person that told his wife already that, you know what, I can't change the, the diaper because I'm late for work. will stop and say, oh, this house is on fire. So you don't need, don't need, don't need any text message or memo to say, even the fire alarm will tell you that it, something is happening here. So when every believer seeks to experience a personal revival in their life, Others get ignited by that fire on your life. Revival starts from every one of us. What you don't have, you cannot give. Let me tell you something. Each and every one of us, the Bible says in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, that the fire sat on each and every one of them. He didn't sit on Peter and James alone. He said the fire sat on each and every one of them. It is the combination of the flickers of fire that causes a mighty flame. Amen. Somebody, you came here with your candlestick already put off. Mando Suzu Brekadegadabokoshtakai. 
Lord, send fire, Lord. Light every candlestick here. When the scripture in Revelation talks about the candlestick, it represents the assignment and the anointing. When God was speaking to the loveless church, he said, for these things, if you do not repent, I will put out your candlestick. They say, what you don't use, you lose. Some of us here, God is going to reignite the fire on our lives. It's going to burn like never before. I sense there are people under the sound of my voice. You have exposed yourself to certain things that are not right. And what it has done is that it has quenched the fire on your candlestick. You know yourself. But let me say something to you. There's no need to worry. Something is going to spark again. You're going to leave this place with fresh fire. And that fire will never be put out. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Revival is not a move of God in a building. It's a move of God in a man. And if it does not flow through you, it is not revival. It is reversal. So this is where I round up tonight because I have, we have to do some warfare quickly. How is revival battered? How does God intend to bring this widespread revival in this season? First King chapter 18. I may not go into so many scripture reading, but I'll give you the scripture references because of the sake of time. I just want to f- run fast, but I'll give you the scripture references. But we're taking, because I believe something happened in 1 Kings chapter 18, that is a, it's a prophetic sign and a prophetic symbol to how God will walk in these last days to see revival break out. 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18. You see, like the world, we cannot misplace our priorities. In this passage of the scripture, the people thought what they need was rain. When you are out of tune with God, you will misplace your priority. Your appetite changes. Your need, you know what, is distorted. What you think you need is not actually what you need. And that was what the people thought they needed. They thought they needed rain. But what they truly needed is what the world needs today. But today we think that what the nations did, particularly our economic leaders, are sitting down day in, day out, hours and hours, trying to find a solution for what they think the nation need. If you read the book of Acts of the Apostle, there was social stability but it wasn't by policy. It was by an outpouring. Pentecost brought social stability and community reformation. Pentecost did not only birth the church. Pentecost addressed governmental issues. And that is why I know that the nation is heading the wrong direction. Let me tell you something. I have been saying this since God sent me to this country and I've been saying it and I'll keep saying it. That our government is still confused. Honestly speaking, see, I pray, let me tell you something. I'm a firm believer. I'm a firm respecter of what? Of government authorities. Because you see, there's no way, like I said, we're going to see revival without walking side by side. But you see, we don't understand that. See, if we don't understand their confusion, we don't know how to hear God. And that is why they still, they, some of them know. But they're not just bold enough to tell themselves that what we need is not policy reformation. It's to get God back into the equation. It's to get God back into the soul. The Bible says none lacked anything. Do you know how many people that cannot afford food today? Because of government policies. 
But scripture says when the revival broke out, when the Holy Ghost came, it did not only give birth to the church, it did not only give tongues to the believers, it also met people's need. Community was touched. Church was an overflow of missions. Where do we put all these converts? From the church. Where do we put all these converts? From the church. And we must come back to that day. We must return to that day. It is the overflow of the effect of the Holy Ghost in the community that should make us be planting churches and filling the house of God and be meeting and gathering because how do we, where do we put these people? How do we nurture them? How do we disciple them? How do we how can they continue in their apostle doctrine? That was the purpose of the building. So, so the people thought that what they needed was rain. I know what God arrested them by that false need. You think you want rain, okay? Because at the end of the day, it wasn't about the rain. They got what they actually needed. In fact, the reason why the rain stopped was to get the attention to their real need. And, and, and that is the same strategy because the Bible is clear about the things in the Old Testament. You know what? As a shadow of what is in the New Testament. So God is still working. That's why Jesus Christ did not come to say he comes to what abolish the, the law. He came to fulfill it. So the things of the Old Testament are pointers and prophetic signals for how God will operate in what in these days that we're living in. Because Peter stood in Acts of the Apostles and he was quoting an Old Testament prophet, Joel. That's why the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 that Christ died on the cross of the Lord that he may what? That the blessing of Abraham. So God has laid precepts. For us to understand how he will move. That is why the Bible says that these things he has not eaten from us. When we are spiritually, when we, are, when we spiritually descend the things of God, when we understand the Old Testament, we are not of men ignorant, not understanding how God is working in these days because we already see the patterns is laid as to how he's going to do things. So, Elijah's act here reveals certain things to us. So, just a couple of scriptures. I'll, I'll advise you to read all of First Kings chapter 18. You get the whole picture, but I'll just speak a couple of scriptures from here. Let's read from verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So, all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribe of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. Verse 32 now. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seer of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bulls in pieces and laid it on the wood and said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the bond sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time and they did it a second time and he said do it a third time and they did it the third time so the water ran all through the altar and it also filled the trench with water and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said Lord God of Abraham Isaac and Israel let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I'm your servant and that I have done all these things at your word hear me O Lord hear me that the people may know that you have you are the Lord God and that you have turned their heart back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the bond sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Verse 39 Now when all the people saw it they fell on their face and they said, the Lord is God the Lord is God. And verse 40 and Elijah said to them, seize the prophet of Baal do not let any one of them escape. So they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and executed them there. Three years, no rain. Why? Like I said, God was trying to get the attention of the people. So God sent his prophet back to say, you know what? Go back. 
because I'm going to use the guise of what bringing back rain to get the people's attention. But the original intention for all of this drama was because God was said to cause a revival that would turn the heart of the people back to himself. The heart of the nation in which we are today is far from God. Gone are the days, I see, and we must understand the progression of what of Antichrist. Now, the reason why it becomes more difficult for us to even evangelize like before is because, and that is why, sir, we must break away from tradition. Because we were trained that the form of evangelism is give your life to Christ. People must what believe in God. But do you know that the enemy is so crafty that what we're dealing with now is not people saying, I don't believe in God, but people who are indifferent about your God. I'm not saying there's no God, but I don't just care. <laughs> we're not, we are not equipped for that. So that's when somebody says, you know what, I believe there's a God, but I'm not just interested. Evangelism finishes for that day. <laughs> it's, it's finished for that day. And we resolve to, you know what, God bless you, and we know God will touch. We know God will touch your heart someday. <laughs> exactly. No. So we are not dealing with the same thing because we are trained to get somebody to believe there's a God, but now they believe there's a God. They're just indifferent about it. So our strategy must change. The way we get these people must change. So, so, uh, so the whole idea of this whole drama of 450 prophets dancing around stupidly around, you know, a sacrifice all day, cutting themselves and, 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 and molesting themselves was all about turning a heart of a people, of a nation back to God. Whether you're going to be standing behind this pulpit, whether you're going to be a marketplace minister, our number one assignment if you are here in this country is to seek the heart of this nation turn back to God. In any way we're going to go about it. If you are asking, what's my purpose in life? What am I called to do as a Christian in this nation? Our assignment is to seek ways through the wisdom of God to turn the heart of this nation back to God. And that is what this whole drama was about. That is, that was Revival in the land. Revival in this most simple definition is to turn your heart back to God. A heart that has stopped beating for God begins to burn for God. A a life that has been void of a prayer life, all of a sudden, you come into an encounter with God, your prayer life is uncontrollable. You just want to love God all the days of your life. You just want to seek His will. You don't make decisions that that does not involve God. You think that see, it's not falling and rising up. Many people fall down, and when they rise up, Father, they, they become even more because they just mess everything all up. But revival is your heart, because so many things is calling for the attention of our heart, and that is God's treasure in your life. See, God is not interested in your car. He wants you to have a good car. He's not interested in your house. Isaiah 66. Where is the house that you will build me? The heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. He says, but upon this one that has a contrite heart. That's why a man who has no idea of national service all of a sudden becomes the king of a nation. I should have assumed that as management expert, which I also do teach as a leadership expert, is that you recruit from within before you extend. So, at least seven boys had that experience serving their nation. So, there's experience of national issues, national policy. So, let's recruit one of these guys who already understand what serving a nation is. But can you see how God can bypass experience for the sake of a man who has a heart that burns with him. So, God is interested in the heart of this nation. And scripture tells us very clearly in Revelation that there's going to be a parade. It's not going to be a parade of bishops (laughs) with their heart. Oh, yes, it's not going to be a bishop. Ah, 
It's a parade of nations dancing and waving their flags. Because the blood was shed for nations. God has nation in his heart. That is why when you seek God's agenda being established in a nation, you have become what on God's A-list of people he would do anything to ensure that your well-being is taken care of. Because God has every nation in his heart. You see, let me tell you something. You must find, like Jesus Bible said, he read where it was written concerning him. There are scriptures that have been written concerning your destiny. How I know, one of the scriptures, how I know how that I have an apostolic ministry to the nations. And when we're talking about Lord, send me to the nation, it's just not one flimsy ambition of everybody wanting to go to. Not many of us are called to the nation. Kenneth Dickey never left one place. The whole nation came to him. The whole nation came to him. The world came to him. God showed me a scripture which everybody knows. It might not mean the same thing to you, but God speaks to us, interprets as he wills. He said, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. I have a mandate to teach the word of grace around the world. And God asked me, the Holy Spirit asked me a question that morning I was praying. He said, is there any nation in the world that sin does not abound? That is, oh, there's one country. They don't sin there. There's no sinner there. I said, no. He said, therefore, if I've given you the word, the mandate of grace, that means, you know what, where there's sin there, you take the word of grace there. First confirmation, I knew that was God was calling me to the nation. Take the word of grace, everybody. It's the grace of God that's appeared to all men. So that's why I know I'm not called to a race. A particular race. And I've seen it fulfilled. I'm seeing it fulfilled right before my eyes without any struggle because grace appears to all men. So I must appear to all men. So I don't struggle for acceptance. It's the mandate. I don't knock on doors. It opens. It's the mandate. When grace shows up, he said it abounds much more. It must swallow up sin. It must swallow up condemnation. So it's about the heart of this nation. And we must speak. Some of us speak. Me. He said, ask of me and I'll give the nations to you. Some of us have never prayed and said, Lord, give me nothing half as my inheritance. It's part of the prayer we're going to pray tonight. He says in John 14, 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Why does he want to do it? John chapter 15 verse 8 By this your father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you may be his disciple. One of the proof of being a disciple of God is to what is to bear fruit. Not just fruit, but much fruit. So let me tell you something. You're not praying on that trust No, Some of us are afraid to ask God for 100 million because you do 100 million is selfish. You want to live in a good house. If, if you must have 100 Let me tell you something. This bottle of water, an average human being needs about eight a day. Average human being eight a day to have the accurate water system in your body. There's about six billion people on earth. So you just say, okay, you want to fulfill uh, Matthew 25. You know, when I was hungry, you didn't visit me. When I was in prison. So you want to fulfill scripture. Don't you want to fulfill scripture? And say, you know what? I don't have too much money. But out of the eight you need, I want to give you one a day. You must be a billionaire. And do you know how many people? About 600 million people on earth right now cannot afford a bottle of water. And they need eight per day. So tell me, is it tongues that will give them water? He says, so that you may be my disciple, follower of Christ, doing good. He says, how God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and power, who went about, before he started healing, who went about doing what? Good. Good is not went about and mo korobo koshe kete kete. You are hungry, take food. That's good. That's justice. You need water, take water. You see, let me tell you something. We're still praying about, you know what? Oh, there's a family who is in need. I say, you know what? Give us some time to pray and see if God wants us to get involved. You are not a Christian. Pray to get to save life. Pray to get food to the hungry. Let me see whether the Spirit is releasing me and I'll come back to you on that. You can pray on the husband to marry, on the wife to marry. Not pray to, to help somebody. Don't get there. Don't even near it. Pray to help somebody. So you understand that, see, when we are talking about this thing, it's not get rich message. It's not prosperity teaching. This is kingdom teaching. That is what the blessing does. The blessing is to make heaven on earth. The blessing is to come. What is to what is to silence the effect of curses. Curse, poverty, hunger is part of the curse. 
the only thing designed to deal with the effect of curses is the blessing so when we're talking about the blessing we're not talking about just money we're talking about the empowerment to solve problem so let me tell you something when we are talking about great wealth transfer it's not just talking about one good book put about the person it's part of the agenda of the end time for there to be a transfer of wealth so that somebody can have one bottle of water per day one of the ladies who ministered to Nagogo in Nigeria, this lady, student, she's still a university student. Sir, she started a school. A school. A student, university student. They have uniform, they've given her a building, they are constructing it, they have teachers. She has employed some of her other students who are academically brilliant and they are teachers, they are proprietors of the school. And I said, you know what? Send me your details immediately. We're getting involved in this. I'm not praying about it. The other day, my wife came. Somebody called us from US and said, Oh, there's a couple in the UK who, you know what, something, something happened to them. And you know what? She doesn't, can't get access to benefit. She's pregnant. Da, 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 da. And my wife was telling me, I said, Get that card number straight away. It's nothing to pray about there. And to the glory of God, since then, weekly, doesn't change. Weekly, whether the church has enough or not, they must have something. How much is what they need? The need of the church is, is nothing compared to the need of a human to eat, feed someone who is pregnant. To the glory of God, they gave him that last week. And the support is still going on to glorify God. This not this is this is this this is this is the kingdom. This is what is meant to be. That's why I said if you are not faithful in little, who is going to put more into your hands? You don't understand. Many of us stand in church today and we begin to confess Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards me, blah the blah the blah the blah, having sufficiency and all of that. The prayer was provoked by people who gave out of their poverty. It didn't the, the Bible did not describe it as poverty. Deep poverty. You see, there are some actions you take that provoke blessings from God. Paul looked at them. Even in your deep poverty, yet you gave yes. and my God is able to make all grace about to us. It's not the kind of attitude we have today that provokes that kind of dimension of blessing. That's what we're talking about. These are the things that lead to the people change their heart. This family we support is not even live, they don't even live in London. So it's not about doing it to get them into church. They don't even live in London. They don't. It doesn't take prayer over that and pray. Let's pray and see if God is releasing us to help. That's a demonic prayer. Oh yes. Oh yes. He said he went about doing good. He went about doing good. So So the real essence was not about rain. The lack of rain, of course, affected the economy. It affected, you know what, stability. But it wasn't about scarcity being turned to abundance or supply. It wasn't about that. When you are in tune with God, when you and God have a good standing, your welfare is sorted. You see, sometimes last year, every year we do something at church, a series that I do the whole of April, and we're going to start this Sunday, Faith Clinic, and we just look about faith. And last year I, we did, God just kept it going. So I did about eight weeks on teaching on faith, and we had a 10 series pack on Faith Clinic series. But that's to show you the extent of which are taught in faith. But recently, God led me to teach an aspect of faith that has forever changed. You know, when God is, you are, as a speaker, as a, as a pastor or a preacher, when God is speaking to you and the message God is saying to preach is changing your life, you know you're hearing from God. And God led me to taught a, a, a teaching on growing in faith in God as your father. Many Christians have a God-master relationship with God. That is why we talk to God in prayer like we talk to Him. When we begin to see God as our Father, it will change things in our life. The Old Testament folk related to God as a master, as a God. But in the covenant that we have in Christ, He's your heavenly Father. That's what the Pharisee and the traditionalists could not understand when Jesus spoke, to, spoke about God as his father. When Jesus taught us to pray, he didn't teach us to pray to a God. He taught us to pray to a father. So when you are in tune with your father, 
your welfare is not your prayer point. My son doesn't pray before he goes to bed tonight, pray for his welfare for the next day. It is my responsibility and my wife's responsibility to take care of their needs. They don't think about it. That's why Jesus was saying, why do you worry about what you wear, what you eat and all? It's not your business to think of that. You think of the things that please your father and your father will deal with the things that concern you. Your responsibility is to please your father. Find out what is pleasing, what will please your father. Devote your life to what is pleasing your father. The rest, your welfare is his responsibility. He said, all these things the nation seek after. The father, your heavenly father knows you need them. He said, but seek first his kingdom. The kingdom is what is in the heart of the father. So when you are seeking the father, you will live in the kind of house that even your imagination cannot bring for you. Some of us will dream of these things. We don't know God is just mm, small. Increase it. And you say, ah, okay, a mansion. Small. Increase it. Because that's how much he loves you. I want the best for my son. You know, today my wife and I were just discussing, what do we do for Israel tomorrow? It's his birthday. I'm, I said, no, 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 I want us to blow his mind. I, 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 I just want us to, for the next one year, let him be thinking of the birthday every day. The guy doesn't even care. Maybe if you just give him a treat. Well, as if I, you know, let's, let's blow his mind. Let's just drive him crazy. That's how God thinks. When he has a conversation with ministry angels assigned to the heirs of salvation because they are the one that delivers the package. He's just, I want to blow this guy's mind. I just want to run him mad. That's how much, that's what he does for me. That's why he we, we just makes us cry everywhere we go because when we look at the things he does, we just begin to cry. I don't know if there's anybody like that. God just so embarrasses you. So you just be crying like a baby. I don't know about you, but I cry every, almost every time. I just cry. I just cry. Even on this trip, I just went. I cried. Lord, why are you doing this kind of thing? That's how much he just wants to embarrass me. Which is blessing. So, let's look at a few things. And this is why I close. Hmm. So, it's a hard transition. So what's the first thing Elijah did that the church must do today to see revival? The first thing he did, the Bible says Elijah repaired the broken altar. He repaired. God did not just send him there and say, you know what, now go and tell the people to turn their heart back to me. I'm their God. I'm their this. No, there is a process. That is why it is not just our shouting of revival that brings revival. It's our walkings of revival. There are things that the church must do. There are things, there are lifestyles, there are cultures that a church must develop. And when I mean the church, I'm talking about we, we are the church. There must be a a culture in our life that we may that may bring revival in our lives, therefore leading to a, 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 a revival in the, in the nation. He says, so, he restored and repaired the broken altar. Many of us here, we are standing at the tip of our next level, but I sense the reason why we stood there for a long time is because our altars have been broken down. And I sense in my spirit, God is speaking to someone tonight. As you leave this place, grace is going to come on you for you to go and rebuild your altar. Because it is very central to the move of God in your life and through your life. Our churches today must pay attention on our altars. We must. Like never before. Nothing is going to happen without a a solid altar. It's the beginning of revival. It's the beginning of God what kissing the earth. Yeah. It is through the altar that God kisses the earth. That's where the pot has opened over. And that is why Satan is what is attacking altars. Like never before men of God have been attacked. The altar has been attacked. It's not the man that the enemy is after. It's the altar. Once the altar is broken, once the altar is defiled, Forget about it. Satan rules. But God forbid, Jesus remains the Lord. That's why we must pay attention 
to our altars. That's why we can't be carried away. That's why we can't compromise because our altars must be solid. So these guys did not understand. Let me say something. There is no religion. And of course, apart from Christianity, other religions are dead religions. But every religion has altar. They understand the place of altar. In fact, we don't treat our altar like the occultic world treats their altar. We don't have regard for our altar. That's why people come here and do all sorts of things. Because for us, it's just what a material that is that helps you to put your Bible on or to or to the spirit. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just enjoying myself. He told me to. <laughs> because I'm, I'm a man under authority. If he said don't enjoy yourself, I would have just been serious and go my way. But he said enjoy yourself, so I'm, I'm a man under authority. <laughs> we must respect our altar. My father, he was, my father is from Edo, and this guy grew up in England all his life. Didn't even understand anything in his tradition. But yet he had an altar in his room that he doesn't even service. But that's just to show you that the occultic world understands the power of an altar and then we mistreat and would undermine an altar in our Christian life. So that's why these guys could not get anything done. They just danced around the pool and did a when they did all their mess, Elijah said, now let me show you the process of revival. First of all, address the altar issues. And as God is working in some of us here tonight because see, you are strategic, you know what, to influence, kingdom influence. But it cannot happen until you leave this place and you go back home and what, and rebuild your altar. Nothing will happen there is no heavenly transaction without an altar. There is no spiritual transaction without an altar. So Elijah said, let's repair the altar first of all. And I strongly believe that that altar of many Christians must be replaced today. The altar, the place of the altar does not mean so much to the believers today. Whereas an altar is where we see salvation, it's where we see deliverance. It's where we see repentance. It's where we see true worship. It's there sincere prayers is offered. And you know what? And it's the place where man meets with God and God touches man. That's the place of the altar. God, man comes to meet God at the altar and God comes to touch man at the altar. So when the altar is broken, you know what we've just done? We've just what? Separated the touch of God on man. And it is the touch of God that what that makes that makes fearless apostles out of fearful disciples. That's the place of transformation. It is the touch of God on the life of a man that makes a difference in the man's life and causes him to make a difference in his world. Were it not for the touch of God on this boy that you see? I probably dead to the or maybe in lifetime imprisonment because I was already already heading that direction. Been and out of prison about three times in different parts of Nigeria. I would have probably just died. Maybe one day, just I've smoked myself to death because I was high, a very high Indian smoker. I probably would not have made sense today if I'm not dead and I've not smoked myself to death. But not matter to anybody because I, I just. I dropped out of two schools. Maybe I would have tried the third one and the same thing would have happened, dropped out of another school again. But when the finger of God came upon my life, I wrote two world class book as a dropout. Something touched my brain. That's why if I minister to you academically this night, it's done. When I did my first higher diploma course in this country, if by the grades with distinction, I passed all my classes at distinction level, first class. I'm currently doing a course in creative writing to nurture my nature as a, as a writer in, in Barbeck University. My first year, dusted it. That was a, once a school dropout. What happened? Was I reading all night? No, the finger of God. I meditated upon your testimonies. I became wiser than my teachers. It tells me what to read. I retain what I read. I have creative ability to do what to put my notes together. 
the finger of God. So the altar is where God, man comes to meet God and God touches man. When that touch comes upon you, it transforms things in your life. Changes things in your life. Makes you a world changer. Makes you relevant. Gives you the ability, gives you the power to enforce kingdom agenda in the earth. That's why the word bless is to be empowered. So the touch of God on the man's life is what empowers that man to make a difference in this world. So when the hand of God is not on the church, how do we make a difference? Because why? The connection point is what? It's disconnected. It's disconnected. So that's why Elijah requested for the altar. The second thing, what did he do? The Bible says he called the people near to himself. He's there. He said he called the people near to himself. You know what that signifies for us today? It's corporate agreement and submission to the master's will. Elijah understood certain, certain parts of Joel's prophecy for, what, for the end time. God was going to pour out his spirit on the people. Joel's prophecy is a people shall arise. And what the prophet of Baal did was to do it on their own. And they would have done it. The people would not have understood what was happening. They would not have been able to reproduce it. They would have been in conflict with it because naturally the human nature is that what you don't understand, you're in conflict with it. That's why, you know what, Africans make a lot of superstition out of things. When they don't understand mystery, they call it superstitions. They just give it all this kind of messed up stuff because they don't understand it. But what God wants to do now in these days because it's a movement of a people, everybody must be involved. It is not just, it is not, that's what killed Moses. I tell you, there are some things that becomes my lifetime prayer when I read it. You see, God are the days where you see, you see, man of God, they have certain revelations. It's like this. My pastor told me, Reverend Sam, he said, the first time he watched the Mouse Moreau CD, it was somebody that brought it and he played it, they listened to it, he removed it, put it under his armpit. I went away with it. Can't even drop it for one hour. We are not in those days anymore where it's one man that knows something. It will kill your ministry on time. My prayer is, Lord, do not only appear to me, appear to all my church members. Whatever you are showing me, show them. It was difficult for Moses to move them beyond what he knew. They didn't know it. In fact, they said, we don't care. You go and hear God for us. And he thought it was a cool thing. I'll come back with Revelation. Chief officer of Revelation. Thus said the Lord. Only you know what God is saying. Your ministry will die. Not like us that we have to be in many places now and I'm the only one who knows something. <laughs> I'm finished. I'm finished. So when people say, you know what, Pastor, this is what I feel we should do. I'm happy. At least somebody is hearing God, not only me. We can walk together. You know, it's very difficult for people to follow what they don't know. And they say, what you are told, you may doubt, but what you see, you can't doubt. When God shows you things, you can't doubt it. If I tell you something, I can say, oh, Pastor, maybe it's for his good. But when God shows you, you can't doubt it. So, Elijah called all the people together. And that is why for the church to be able to bath revival, there must be a corporate submission not just agreement. Listen, it is one thing for you to be in agreement. You know some people, we call meetings, we pastors, we sit a lot, I'm sure. We call meetings and we say, oh, this is the, we, we have a project, this is a phase in our ministry, we are transitioning in our ministry. And people say, yes, we are transitioning. Transition brings responsibility. Spider-Man's uncle told you, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> is it a lie? <laughs> So we may agree that there's a breakthrough coming, but we may not be in submission to the process of breakthrough, sir. <laughs> we may not. I've seen it times and times and times. We agree there's a movement, but we don't submit to the process of movement. So Elijah called the people together, signifying until we come to the unity of faith. Unity is different from uniformity. If you scan spiritually some church, all of them are wearing shorts and t-shirts and ties like men in school. 
That's why if Pastor Fry is here, members must fry their hair. <laughs> Unity is different from uniformity. Unity is diversity. <laughs> Unity in Christ is diversity in agreement with the will of the master. That's why we are different parts of the body, but all joined together through one spirit. The hand is different from the leg. The leg is different from the eyes. But we are all working together for the good of one. Today, if my finger begins to do things on its own, I'm in trouble. Because I need the coordination of both hands to make this message, you know, more effective in dissemination. There are some things my mouth will not explain. That my mouth, my hand can do it very well. So if I want to bring my hand this way, the answer, I'm going that way. I'm in trouble. And that's what the church needs to come to. For there to be a revival, it's not about Catholic, it's not about Anglican, it's not about Pentecostal, it's not about Charismatic, it's about the kingdom agenda. We must pull together and in submission to the will of the master to see his kingdom advance in every sphere of life. And that's when, when that is in place, we'll stop hearing like things. Pastor, I didn't come to church for two weeks because I didn't like how that sister looked at me. You've made it all about yourself. Don't forget. Wake up. It's about the kingdom of God. Pastor, all three were in Nigeria. You didn't even send the text that you came. That's why I'm not happy. <laughs> for what? The guy is, you, you, you know what he's doing? When you're supposed to be, those who are praying for Pastor, God bless you. We hear all sorts of things today that just make like, oh my God. Seriously? Seriously? Come on, man. The sacrifice I'm making is not enough. So I must. I've now left. I've gone now. I'm heading to Elishon. Just to let you know. Pastor, God is sent to Nigeria every day. Lord, whatever it is you're doing, Lord, I stand in agreement with your servant. It will be done. Your kingdom was advanced. You can't be doing that. What pastor needs to pray for, God will be meeting it. He will be meeting it. It's about that corporate submission. It's about coming under that covenant. He says a people, even when the Bible says that the army that Joel described had their uniqueness, but the Bible says they moved in formation. They had their differences. They had their unique skill, but there was a formation. There was a togetherness. There was a unity in them. Unique ministry, unique calling, but the same purpose, sir. Different style of ministry, but the same purpose. Are. So it doesn't matter. We're not offending ourselves. We're not in competition because the Bible says they were not in any way of, you know, what disturbing themselves. They were not in competition. They were marching. They had a marching order. Our marching order is to advance the kingdom. We can do it in our unique ways, but we don't compete with one another because we're all under submission to the master's will. So the Bible says he called all of them together. The church, I'm sorry, cannot battle revival when everybody is doing their own. See, thank God that this church is called Ecclesia Kingdom Movement. It's a movement. It's not a monument. We are, I'm telling you the truth. If they chase us out of this building today, God forbid, we will do ministry. I'm telling you the truth. We will do ministry. I have done ministry in all kinds of places. When God began to use me on campus, we moved from large hall to kitchen. It doesn't matter. I told them this kitchen is taken away from us. We'll move on the grass. We'll do ministry. It's not about a building. It's a movement of the spirit. We must be available to do. If God says it, maybe you're here, you're thinking, oh, you know what? Oh, I'm going to be a pastor. And God is saying, you know what? Get out. Get out. That's why we're so comfortable in here where we need to be out there on the streets. It's a movement. It's a movement. Even Bob Marley understood movement of the people. If you understood we are supposed to be on Exodus, we don't get Exodus. We just want to sojourn. No. You see, God told me something several years ago and he was teaching me. He said, the reason why there can't be a revival in any nation is because Revivalists are busy enjoying Sunday service. Many happy is the man who has his quiver full. 
children are like the arrows and the arrow is not in the quiver for the archer to massage it oh my quiver is filled with arrow that's why you should love your pastor because it's not the kind of pastor that is massaging you in the quiver ah one two three ah they're all in church today god bless you ah where is sister this ah Sir, she says she's not coming to service today because she's out in the city center evangelist. She said today she wants to evangelize there. That's what we want to be hearing. He says they, they shall contend with the enemy at the gate. There's no enemy inside here. The enemy is out there. The arrows are not meant to be there. That's why God gave Moses a wake-up call here. Enough of admiring the burning bush. Your place is in Egypt. Did you see anybody to deliver here? Did you see any slave here? I only got your attention. Church is to get your attention, empower you, go to Egypt, and let my people go so that they may serve me. So the church is only a burning bush. Get out of the burning bush. There is no one to save in the church. There is no slave in the church. The slave is in Egypt. Because the guy was just there. Ah. Ah. Eh? Wow. Powerful service. What's the result Monday? Church ends on Sunday. Kingdom begins on Monday. So, church ended in that place. Now, get to Egypt. Go and do real kingdom business. That is one of the will of the master that we must agree with and submit to. And we will see things happen in our churches, in our lives. Number three things he did. The Bible says he caught the bull. I'm running up. He caught the bull. These are symbolic signs. You must read signs. He said he caught the bulls. That's talking about sacrifice. For us, that's sanctification in the New Testament. Consecration. You see, it is not enough for there to be an altar. There must be a sacrifice on the altar. A living sacrifice. That's what the Bible says. We must be totally sanctified unto the Lord, totally dedicated, totally consecrated for the altar to burn. I have never seen an or any altar that is transforming society, that is changing lives, that does not have a sacrifice in it. And that's why Paul said, I die daily. We all must come to that place where we are dying on a daily basis. There's constantly a sacrifice on the altar for it to want to be an altar that can change things. The altar is not for people who want to live a convenient life. He said it cut the bull into pieces. A symbolic sign that we must lay our lives on the altar. It's a process. And that's why I said we must submit to this process. Jesus said, I have come to what set fire on earth. How I wish this fire has been kindled. But there is a baptism that I must be baptized with. For me to see the manifestation of my assignment, there is a process I must submit with to. to. So revival is not a function of our wish or our hope. It's a function of what we are ready to take upon ourselves. Did, did, Did you read about William Seymour of Azusa Revival? In a service like this, the guy will have a box in his head. No interaction with earthly things. Paul said, I did not confer with flesh and blood for me to get into this sort of guy I got into. William Simon will sit down here, put a box in his head. Praise and worship is going on. The guy shot himself from the whole world. You dare not speak to a robot on his way to to, to, to meet him. He's also in the Can I take it? You know, you will forget about it. You're wasting your time. Total sanctification. I read or a robust boot. If you see the impossible, you the invisible, you do the, He says, see, he dare not step out on his camp meeting until God spoke. Lord, what are you saying? God can't do that. What are you? I pray to God. I said, Lord, I don't want to be invited. When I was a young minister, Lord, ha, ah, invite invitation, invitation, invitation. No, no. When I'm invited, I tell God, Lord, I have been invited, but please, sir, send me. I am sent here tonight. 
because I always tell God, Lord, thank you for the invitation, but sir, send me. Send me. Because when you are sent, there's backing. There's backing. Everything you say, it backs it up with sense and understanding. See, it's not a statement of pride. I don't leave a place and testimonies don't follow. Because when I say, sir, if it's going to take my hours, please, sir, let me be a sent one. I don't just want to be a called one. I want to be a sent one. Please, sir, send me. Give me a word. Send me. Authorize me to go. There must be what on authorization. Because even when Jesus began to speak and demonstrate, the guys, the old guy said, by what authority? Another translation says, with what credentials? is he doing these things because you must have a credential to back the things you're saying and the things you're doing up so consecration is key you cannot move the things that is meant to be moved through the altar without consecration that's what happened in first chronicles 13 we saw it when David was going to move the ark of the Lord back to what to Israel, and they tried to do it the old, the new school way. The new school way. Just like if you are married here, the new school group cannot get you to the mood. Now nah, you need to go back to the old school. That's where the real soul is. When I have dinner with my wife at home, we don't do worship like this. Like pastor, I'm, I'm satisfied. Old school. That's why we're doing old school things tonight. We must get back to the basis. We must get back to the road. He said, these things have been ordained for the Levite. The Levite had been ordained by God to be the one to bear the Ark of the Covenant, not on any sophisticated machine. On their shoulders, the government must be on their shoulders. There must be sacrifice. There must be a deadness, you know what, to these things that we want to do if we're going to do it. So when they try to do it the new school way, somebody get lost his life to it. That's why we cannot move the things of the kingdom with our flesh. That must, that's why we must die for us to be able to live to the one requirement of the kingdom. You don't understand what happened. The Bible says the government shall be upon his shoulder, talking about Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 1, chapter 9, verse 6. And he was talking about him. Did you wonder why Jesus had to what carry his cross on his shoulder? But how would he have done that if he did not understood it? Because as a carpenter back then, there was no tractor, there was nothing to bear. And you have to go into the thick of the wood to get this wood, you know what, this timber and all of that. But if you understand, you know what, carpentry, to carry a log of wood, the easiest way is to carry one end on your shoulder and drag it to your store as one man because you're not going to get help. It was preparation for the cross. Which was a prophecy that it was what his shoulder must be. In other words, which signifies, you know, what is totally sold out. It's, it's, it's dead enough to carry this weight. So that's why the bull is significant because there must be a dead man, a dead woman on the altar that would change life and transform nation. Let me say something. See, we have a very you know, not as big as this facility, but I believe in excellence. I love this. But God will constantly remind us that these things don't change nations. I pull everything into excellence in our church. I don't compromise anything that has to do with the kingdom. But we know the truth. These things can't heal the sick. No. They can't. We determine the move of God in our meetings. How dead we because if God wants you to carry a hand, you are not dead enough. You say, Lord, it's not fashionable to carry it that way. You ruin the move of God in that meeting. We come to church many times, and God just says, Today is worship. And you say, Ah, after I've prepared this powerful message, you ruin that service for the whole day. You're not dead enough. Because a dead man has no life on his own. You can, did you, can you imagine a bull that is caught dead and the bull is saying, no, I'm not going, I'm not going. It's dead already. Whenever they put the bull, the bull is there. And that's what makes the altar of God powerful because there are men here who are saying, Lord, I'm yours to command. Not my way. Because if you're not dead, when you begin to be confronted with those circumstances, like Jesus was confronted with it in the Garden of Gethsemane, you will give in. 
The cup, you will allow the cup to pass over you. And the last thing, the last thing he did, the Bible says he poured water. Ask them to pour water. First time, second time, third time. That's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the principal person in the move of God in this end time. He said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit. And that's why the word Elijah commanded them to pour. To pour once, pour the second time, pour the third time, which tells us that, see, in these days, the promise of the latter rain must be pursued. He said, I will give both the former and what and the latter. And our pursuit to see the agenda of God established must be the spirit of God. Thank God. Pastor did mention about that word, that Ezekiel prophecy. But when I was praying today, I don't know for a funny reason, Ezekiel 47 just kept coming up to my spirit. And even when I was asking God for a word, and I'm coming to that because I usually have this custom when I'm going somewhere, I always ask you because I know, sir, I know you're blessed, but every one of us will always seek God. There's a next level, there's a next level. So I want to come into this house and join my faith with yours and say, Lord, what are you saying with my brother? What are you doing, my brother? And God gave me a word for you, sir, but we're going to come to that. And it's glorious. And I said that when you talked about, you know, what the prayer in Nigeria, about the transition, about the graduating, spot on, sir, spot on. Spot on. And funny enough, when I was reading the word that God gave me for you to my, to my brother, he confirmed because he's been praying for this meeting as well. And the same thing he heard. So we must seek the spirit. The spirit in these days is the what is the principal executor of the agenda of God in this end time. At the heart of revival is what is the word on, on in that move of the spirit of God. That's what is at the heart of revival. That's why, see, if we must tarry until we see it, please, sir, let's tarry. It's, see, it changes everything. Let's spend, I would rather spend the whole day waiting on God for his spirit. Rather, you know what, orin without his spirit. I would rather any meeting, like when we go to this, when I go to, like, 30 days. 30 days. For any meeting I'm going for that involves this kind of work you saw, you don't see this kind of things happen. Just look at the way God moved powerfully. Rice were delivered. There was a night that pastor was ministering and God just started to use pastor only day to begin to minister to perversion. That was the first time in my life in a meeting that people will own up to what homosexualism. I'm telling you, sir, I received an email three days ago and this lady sent me an email and said, please tell Pastor Lumide, thank you for coming. I'll send you the email. So tell him, thank you for coming. Those things don't happen because we look fine. I'm telling you the truth. These are things that can only happen by the move of the Holy Ghost. Things we do not know of. You think, you think you're saying there are people here who have billions in their accounts come out and they'll throw out? I say you already started having feelings towards homosexualism. Own up. And you see people. Some of those times was the only ghost that moved, that raised it up. Who comes out and says, you know what, I'm, I'm nah, 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 nah. We don't do that. <laughs> How many of us just come and say, ah, this is my weakness? It's the only ghost that helps us to come and own up to it. So that's why the, the symbol of the water is to signify the promise of the last days. He said that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Everything God is going to do in this end time, it is through the Spirit. And we must pursue like never before an overflow of the Spirit. Some of us have been bringing a saucer to the Father and say, Lord, fill my cup, Lord. And then we bring a saucer. Of course, the saucer will be full quickly. So you think you're full of the Spirit. When, when, some, when Elijah told some people, go and borrow vessels, not empty, not even a few. And then we brag about, you know what, I'm so full of the Spirit. You brought a saucer, why would you not be full on time? And some of us show every, every day with barrels. I said, no, fill this thing, sir. You can't change nations with a saucer full of oil. <laughs> So, so we must seek the spirit. As Christians, you should not sit in an exam that you have not seen. I'm not talking about expos. He said, 
The spirit of truth will show you things you don't know of. You carry your book, candles, see brash, kushtakaya, lindo eshto zuzegedabologodoshta. Holy Spirit, where do I read? Show me. Mando suzu The life of a believer is not a difficult one. He said, when God led them through the desert, they tasted not. He knows, he knows where the water is in the rock. So when you carry your textbook, candles, shoes of the bread, Lord, I give you praise. You just worship God and God begin to lead you. How, what is your testimony if God is not helping you? When I sit down with someone, and another student, my testimony should be the little I did plus the grace of God. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. So if you don't have a testimony of grace, people cannot come to the salvation, to their salvation. Because if you can do it by their power, they can do it by their power. So when others are laboring, quit laboring. Ask God to show you. It's better to labor in the things God show you than to labor in the things that you think you is right. It's going to be more stressful. And the Holy Spirit is the one that has that. Scripture says these mysteries are ordained for our glory, even to other people, but revealed to us through the Spirit. He said, no one knows the things of a man except for the Spirit of that man. So also no one knows the things of God except for the Spirit of God. Yet he reveals the deep things of God to us. So if you don't know the things of God, how can you establish the things of God? And it is the Spirit that has the assignment to reveal the things of God to you so that you can walk, walk in the things of God and establish the things of God. So like never before, the move of the Spirit is essential and crucial and vital to the world, to the end time assignment, which is to turn the heart of the people back to God. No one can change the heart of any man if the Spirit of God is the one that leads people to repentance, is the Spirit of conviction, is the one that changes the heart of people. And we're talking about revival here, which is turning the heart of people back to God. Without the Spirit, it's just going to be gimmicks. Gimmicks don't work. That's why a lot of people today who claim to give their life in Christ in our churches come back every Sunday and give their life to Christ. But I read of Charles Finney that 99% of the people who gave their life to Christ under his meeting went to heaven, you know what, as believers. None of them came back to the altar. True repentance. True move. That's why when the lady was praying about an authentic encounter tonight, I love such prayer. I love such word from God. Many of our revival meetings today is the same people coming back. Same people coming back because they are not touched. Truly touched. Because why we do gimmicks. You know, there's a way we coin this world. Even our altar call today, there's a way we put fear in people, they quickly run out. When the Spirit of God is in the place, you don't even need to get to the altar call. People pray. People don't. People don't. Charles Finney will walk into factories. He won't preach. Just walk into the factory and he's going to the MD's office and people are already on the floor asking God to repent. Asking God. I read of a man, I, I read of the story of one of one man of God, Paul in Eche, in Nigeria. This guy, wherever he goes, madman just kneel down before him. Checking into an hotel, a madman will just show up from somewhere, and the moment you know what touches them, the spirit of insanity leads them. But this guy said, told us how he sought the fire of God for days, for days, weeks, because he understood. The Bible says. He has anointed me. The Spirit, the Holy Ghost was the one walking in Jesus Christ to meet me, to change people's life. So he sought the fire of God. He said one day the Holy Ghost came upon him so strongly that his body was literally almost like catching fire. They began to pour water on his body. He said from that day, anywhere in the world he goes to, the fire alarm will go off. And when they evacuate everybody and everybody is running out, his wife will be telling him, you know you are the one causing the trouble. You know you are the one causing this problem again. I'm telling you, real, everywhere they go, the fire alarm, because this guy carries something. You need to see his church, you need to see his meetings. Hundreds and thousands of people gather. In their millions. But this guy knew that, see, the Holy Ghost is the one that draw men unto God. He said, no one can cry Abba Father without the spirit of adoption. The Holy Spirit is the one that walks in the heart of man. So if the Holy Spirit is not walking in you and through you, you cannot see revival. It's the one that draws men unto God. They reported, I read the, I read one of the articles that reported Azusa in a very strange and funny way where white and blacks, you know what, lost the word, the knowledge of their race, of their color because you see white people falling in the hands of black people, you see white people speaking an unusual language, and everybody mechanics, you know what, all kinds of trade, everybody were communing, laughing together, the people who reported Azusa, they, I read the article, 
the Holy Ghost is not that. At that day, racism was very, 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 very strong. And then you see a white man falling in the hands of a black, a black man because the Holy Ghost visited. Nobody cared about their skin color anymore. Nobody cared about their world beliefs anymore. The agenda was the agenda of God. Why? Because the spirit broke out. That's why I love this song by, by Jesus Christ. Spirit break out. Tiara was down. The barriers in our heart. The barriers in the society. When the spirit of God breaks down, what does he do? He tears it down. So that's why Pentecost is central. I did a teaching on reinforcing the blessing of Pentecost. Because Pentecost was central to the revival. The Bible says because of Pentecost, one Philip entered Samaria and it was recorded that the whole Samaria knew Jesus. One man who understood and plugged into the move of the Spirit. How much more when the whole church is baptized under this, under this river. Ezekiel 47 says that this water level so rose did not only rise, but look at where it began. It began from the life of a man, affected, filled the old temple, and left the temple. And the Bible says, everywhere this water went, it was healing things. That's why the Bible tells us in Genesis that a, a water flowed from the east of the garden into the garden and came out through four river hills. And I remember when God gave me that revelation, God said, What is flowing into this church must begin to flow out of this church. And I didn't understand until I understood it from Ezekiel 47 that if it goes out of this church, it must go to heal. That's why Jesus was saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. But look at what happened. Society was changed. The Spirit left him and began to heal things. And Pentecost did what? Five things. When these five things are in place, God's glory is manifested. What is the five things Pentecost did? Reauthorization, redemption, restoration, reformation, and revolution. Five things that Pentecost did. Those are the five effects of Pentecost and that, was, that is what should be happening right now. Because that's what the Spirit of God permits. And lastly, the power of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says he called down fire, which is a symbol Paul, John the Baptist said, I baptize with water, but this one will baptize with fire, which is the power of God. And that's why the Bible says, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and what? With the power. Let me tell you something. Satan asks many of the people that we want to, we want to revive. But the only language these guys understand is power. That's the only language. You don't negotiate. You don't negotiate with him. The church must come to that point where we are standing again in the authority God has given to us. One of the testimonies of this concluded conference was a young man in the midst of all these things. This guy has gambled his whole life away. Presently he's homeless because he's gambled his school fees, he's gambled his house rent, he's in debt because of Gandhi. Young boy, this guy cannot be more than 22. But this guy has just sent a testimony recently. Talk. Don't get people out of such because this is a spirit. You don't confront the spirit. Jesus said, who is that? The Bible tells us that who is the man who wants to possess the good of the strong man? Who would not first bind the strong man? If you don't have power, you can't bind it. Let me tell you something. Just like, just as ability is the proof of physical growth, so also is power the proof of what sonship in God. You can't be a son of God and act as a son of God or as a daughter of God without manifestation of power. You can't. You can't tell me ability as my son grows, he may not be able to have the ability to carry this pulpit now, but as he physically grows, he increases in ability. That's why the Bible tells us that Jesus grew in what? In wisdom and in stature as a proof of his ability. But when he also grew, you know what? In power and demonstrated power, sonship. Romans chapter 1 told us that Jesus was born according to the, he was born the son of David according to the flesh and declared the son of God by what? The power of the spirit of holiness. So your sonship can only be demonstrated through the manifestation of the power of God that is available to you because it is the power of God that, what, that destroys the works of Satan. At all levels, at all levels, it's the power of God. So the, the falling of the fire was a symbol of the fire of God, the power of God that the church must demonstrate in right now. You don't negotiate with the devil. You don't negotiate with people's circumstances. People are how they're bound. It's our responsibility as a church to get involved there and, want and destroy the works of Satan and set these people free. 
So power should not only be available to pastor, pastor and I or any of the pastors. We stand in a time that every child of God must know how to cast out demons. Every child of God must know how to heal the sick. Every child of God must know how to set the, 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 the captives free. The oppressed free. That's the only way we can see the Bible. Because you are there, you are there in the banking industry, you are casting out demons. You are there in the banking industry, you are stopping. I don't, MC, I don't know, there's a book I read. I, I can recommend it, Transformation by Ed Sivoso. Powerful book. And it focuses on what on national transformation at what at least at uh, uh, marketplace minister level, not just in the building here. We need Christians who are outward focused now, not just inward. But if you are going to be relevant out there, you must Come on. have power. God forbid you end up like the sons of Sceva. There are many good intended Christians who go into politics today, politics today, but they end up becoming the same thing. Why? Because there's a principality and power there. It requires power. You don't go out there with good intentions. Good intention cannot work. You need the power to back your good intention up to make a change in this world. You need it. Good intentions is not enough. If you get there with good intention alone without power, so you must first. You must be desperate. You must live a life that what well, Bible says that no one pours a new wine into an old wine skin. That is why this meeting, like Pastor said, is changing somebody. You're going to go out of here a new wine. Uh, it's new wine skin because God is pouring oil, fresh oil. You see, I sense right now that there's a hand of moving with a flax of oil. It's not for everybody. I would have wished, but I won't say what I don't hear or what I don't see. Because you see, seven guys were lined up and there was a flax of oil, on of oil in the hands of Samuel. And this guy was looking to say, you know what, well, who said am I going to put this oil? Candles, Joseph, Rekadesh, Takaya. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Yes, sir. So he was putting the oil, looking for the head. And I see this hand moving right here, right now. But there is a criteria. I'm sure this guy would have just wished to just pour the oil on everybody and say, you know what, go and do things for Israel. But fortunately, God was looking for a kind of a person. He was looking for someone who would not be afraid of the cave life, yet still carry the mandate upon his life. David was anointed a king at 17, but enthroned a king at 30. 13 years carrying the mandate in all kinds of circumstances that many of us don't want to embrace today. So that's why I said the oil is not for everybody. But I, I just said somewhere in my spirit that there's somebody that already carries your heart. And I'm telling and so I, I, I'm not saying this in any derogatory way. I respect all your leaders, but I just sense that somebody here doesn't have a face, but already is beating for what is beating in your heart. And that oil is coming upon you. And we're going to see that person before we leave because as we pray now, you will begin to manifest it. That oil is coming upon someone who already carries their heartbeat for Ecclesia. Who understands and called out, set apart for an agenda which I must commit my life into. With or without anything. You are not in need for a cost, for a reward. You are in need only to please your father as a form of worship for all that is done for you. And the size of hell is delivered you from. It's one of the things that put a passion in my heart for God today. Because I told you there are many things I would have been doing right now. And that have destroyed my life. Probably I would have been dead now. I was telling them in, in this campus conference we had, there was a time I was already consuming cocaine because everything we did then, in that M, drink, squadron, everything was not getting me out of it. So I was already telling our guys, where are we going to move into this cocaine stuff? Maybe that's where my life would have ended if God did not rescue me. The guys became afraid of me. Now, what is this guy saying again? We've not finished with what I'm telling you. I wish I could say the way he said it in, 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 uh, in Yoruba language. It was so great. I can't remember. I was sharing with you. I remember word for word. If I, he abused me and called one of my friends I introduced to her and said, This is your friend. He's already running mad. <laughs> Look at what this guy is saying again. He's already talking about cocaine. Don't bring this guy to my house anymore. I'm telling you the truth. 
Don't bring him to my house anymore. This guy is running mad. He's talking about cooking. What have we done now that he's already talking about cooking? But I was honest because that's where I was. So I sense when these five things are in place, you know what happens? There is a manifestation of the glory of God. The people were were the one asking in Acts of the Apostles, what shall we do? Thank you, sir. What Elijah had tried to get these people to do, the Bible says by themselves, they looked away from Elijah and they began to look to God and say, you are God. The Lord is God. When these five things come into place, there is a manifestation of the glory of God. And when men taste the glory of God, their heart melts to God. Remember in Joshua what Rahab said to the spies. He said, when we heard of how the Lord has dried the sea for your sake, she only expressed it the way she knew it. But if you read Psalm 114, David explained it clearly. It was the glory of God that made the sea move back. And he says, our heart melted within us. A heart turned to God of Israel without evangelism. The manifested presence of God. I see a manifested presence of God here tonight. And this will so touch your life that as you leave this place, your life will begin to reflect the glory of God and men's heart will begin to turn back to God. Sir, I see that through this movement, many will come to Christ. Let me tell you something. And I'm speaking to this house prophetically. You will realize more people coming to this church equipped and strategically sent. See, this is a deployment center. I hear it clearly in my spirit. Don't worry about the people on the seat. If you don't begin to worry how many deployed out of this movement, we lose the focus. And I know that this is the heart of the church. It's not that, it's not how many that come, it's how many that are sent. It's, see, let me tell you something. The greatest church in these last days will be the ones that are sending our people. How many people went from the upper room? He said the whole world. How many people? It's about the sent ones. It's about the sent. That's what Ecclesia is. It's those who are called and are sent about and are sent. We are saved and sent. God is still asking the question he asked Isaiah. Who will go for us? Who will go for us? Who will go for us? See, there are many cities today, just like the Bible in Matthew described Bethlehem, that see, Bethlehem, don't worry about it. People may describe you as the low city amongst other chief cities. That's what the Bible calls it in Amplified, amongst other chief cities. He said, but don't worry about your status. He said, because a leader shall arise from you that will change your status. And that's why we need to send out men. Because there are places today that need sent men. There are places today that need, you know, what leaders that will change the value of a nation, that will change the value of a community. See, the Lord said to me, he said, the place of the cross is not, today, people wear crucifix for fashion. The cross is celebrated, but the original intention of the cross was condemnation. It is not the place that you want to be killed on. You will probably be, even be hanged to death. The worst crucif- to, uh, 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 crucif- uh, dead is to be crucified. It's meant for what? For, for gangsters, for, for you know, totally bad people. But today we, it's become fashion. Why? Leadership. Leadership. Leadership changes the quality of a world, of a place. Today, every leader in the world, including Obama, wants to visit Rhode Island. It's become a tourist center. It was a place for outcasts. In fact, it was a prison built out of land. It was on an island, totally relegated there, taken out of civilization. But today, people fly to Rhode Island to go and see it. Why? Leadership. And that's why I sense today that there's an anointing coming on someone today that God will pick you from this center and he will send you, he will say, where he's sending you to is to go and change the quality and the value of that location. It doesn't matter how bad a nation is. It doesn't matter how a bad a community is. But when leadership truly arises, and I say there's a leadership mandate on this ministry that God is taking today upon his servant and is placing it on whoever desires. Whoever say, Lord, send me. Lord, I'm available, send me. 
God is multiplying the leadership spirit over this house upon some few people in this house tonight and you will come to pastor and say I'm ready there are places there are communities that are hungry and crying for change and when God called Moses he said to Moses I have heard the cry of my people your anointing is not for you God anointed you because people are crying for change and it's time to get going say to your neighbor get going Say to your neighbor, get going. Say to your neighbor, get going. It's time to arise. It's time to get out of religion. It's time to want to wake up. Rise to your feet. This message has been brought to you freely by Ecclesia Kingdom Movement. To support our ministry and partner with us to increase our impact across the world, reach more people and take advantage of more platforms, we encourage you to consider making a monthly gift of any amount or one-time gift towards the work of the gospel. We'd like to thank you in advance for your support and we value your partnership.